Okay, turning to today's events, um, we're delighted to have Trang Li um, present this, this workshop. Uh, Trang is a postdoc at the Computational Genetics Lab at Penn. She's a mathematics PhD. She's the author and maintainer of many R packages, and she's also a contributor to Teapot. You can find her on Twitter and GitHub um, with the following handle, and you can also learn more about Trang and her work at her website. For today's workshop, there are um, a few important links and you know, we'll be posting these in the chat and they're, they're all available in the Q&A document. So um, your best approach might be to go to this document and then you can find links to the R Studio workspace, GitHub um, and the slides. So at that point, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand off to Trang. Thanks very much. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for saying yes in the chat. Uh, I will be looking at this, the chat quite a bit as well, because I'm hopefully will uh, be able to ask some questions and uh, see your guys' answers there. Um, I'm Chang, but before I start, I'd like to really thank, because I forgot to do this many times before, I'd like to thank our ladies fully for inviting me here and um, I just want to say that you guys have done a terrific job since the beginning of this year, even though it's been a hectic year for all of us. Um, the speakers have been just incredible. We had, uh, let's see, Kelsey, Sharon, uh, Jake, Carla, so many um, incredible speakers, and I've learned so much. And it's just been a really nice community to be with. Um, so I thank you for that. And Thanks for inviting me back this year to present on something that I've always wanted to talk about, which is visualization. Um, okay, so let's get started. I, the entire presentation will be slightly toward acad academia, like academic uh, visualizations, um, but if you're from industry, hopefully you still get some of the visualization principles out of this. Um, and like Amy mentioned, the Q&A is at tidy.cc slash rladies-dataviz. So if you just go there, um, you can post your questions there and you can find links to um, the RStudio Cloud project and the slides and everything else as well. So with that said, uh, hopefully you recognize that this is a pie chart and uh, with these, uh, parts here, you can see all the other words. Yeah, Jude, hey Jude. Um, you realize that this is um, the lyric composition of uh, the Beatles, hey Jude. And I put this up here because I, I found this chart incredibly pleasing. And even though Jake rightly, Jake did say that uh, on Twitter, <laughs> In one thread, I found that this is the only pie chart that I ever find acceptable, um, meaning this whole blue thing is sky, and then this is sunny side of the pyramid, and this darker side is the shady side of the pyramid. Um, and while, you know, I, I think a lot of these kind of hatred toward pie chart uh, is quite ubiquitous, I, I still think that there are, you know, th th there can be meaningful pie charts um, at many places. Um, an example is this Thanksgiving pie chart, uh, pie recipe of this year by Insacasia on New York Times cooking. And um, as you can see, it's, I, I don't know if I can find a better pie chart than this. So <laughs> Jake's saying that he's more relaxed these days. So, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so all of this is to say rules don't always apply. Um, and what I'm going to present today is my own opinion and I'm like the tidy verse quite opinionated about certain things, but you don't have to, you know, stick to them if you find that you find yourself in a situation where other that where that rule doesn't apply. So um, just keep that in mind. One of these rules is, is never to, to use 3D. And I think this is not necessarily true. And a counter example for that is this incredible visual, visualization by Tyler Maureen Wall. And uh, what he's trying to show here is the effect of seawater rising um, 
and how how much and how that affects the coastal land. Um, and you can obviously see that this is beautiful, but it also communicates really well um, how much of the area it affects. And you can see on the right here, you can claim that this is oh actually a two D things, but um, I would argue that I, I would also consider this 3D because of the time component of the animation. So 3D animation, um, they have their place. People also say don't ever use more than seven colors. And I think that doesn't have to be true. Um, this chart, I believe, used, uses nine colors. And they, they actually still communicate the point very well. They, kind of got away with so many colors. I think it's because of the clear annotation. They have um, something called direct labeling, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit more, um, more in a little bit. And uh, they do group the colors together well. There's some shading that they apply really well. Um, this is from The Economist. So yeah, all of this is to say that, you know, rules are good to kind of follow, to, 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 you know, as a, as a um, uh, guide, but you don't always have to stick to it. And, uh, you know, it's okay to be opinionated. I think it's, you know, just be kind when you, uh, when, when you try to convince people that your opinion is better. <laughs> um, okay, so once again, I'm Zhang. I am here because I've made some very bad charts. And I want to show you how to make them better and uh, hopefully not repeating the mistakes that I made in the past. Some of the examples shown here will, um, most of them will be my own charts, but I would also show some uh, other that I find in the literature and um, from collaborators and such as well. Um, so, okay, so that's about me. Um, I'd like to learn a little bit about you guys. So if you could tell me, what is your favorite R package? In the chat, I would like to um, learn where beep R, that's great. Uh, Pettyverse, Gigi Blot, thank you. Beep Fly R, wow, that's fast. Looper Date. Shiny, Survival. Yeah, I need a eight. I've never heard of that. What does eight do, Catherine? I'm learning R, Tidyverse and Base R. Oh, phylogenetics. Juicy summary is great. Final fit. Awesome. Okay, so sounds like everyone is very familiar with NP heat map. Uh, sounds like everyone is very familiar with ggplot, which is amazing. And uh, I need to learn what stargazer is. Um, so that's awesome because what? At the end of this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the ggplot snippet that I learned from just working a lot with it and um, other, you know, uh, talks out there on, on ggplot. So. Okay, so I think one big thing for me when I try to put something in a plot is my, my goal is to reduce the cognitive burden that of the data that I'm trying to communicate. So for example, if I, instead of showing a table of accuracies of different models, different machine learning models that I have done, instead I would draw it because I think it gets to the audience, the reader faster, and they don't have to scan through, you know, 99.95% um, and all of these different cells. And so I think visualizing that helps the reader understand a lot more how much better my model is or um, in which data set my, my model is better and in what data set my, my model is not performing well. And so I think that's one goal that, that we need to keep in mind because sometimes you know people just like to draw pretty things without really thinking about the, the overall goal. And to do that, I think there's some key tools that we, we can utilize. I'm showing here a very nice visualization from this package. It's actually a Python package called SHAP that computes uh, Shapley values. And um, it's, it, it's essentially a, um, uh, 
interoperable feature importance package. Um, I might have mentioned this in a few talks before um, in other early, I think our ladies Miami is where I, I last talked about this, but here what we see is this is one individual <clears throat> and each of these things is a feature or a variable that they have. So their serum uric acid is 524 um, and um, their uh, the urine protein is 12.7 grams for 24 hours. The age at biopsy is 20. And all of these variables are the risk factor that pushing their risk of hypertension up. And that's why you see that um, the the, the, the arrow, the very light arrow here is pushing it up, whereas these other variables is pushing it down. Um, okay, so what's good about this chart? They have, first of all, direct labeling. So what I mean by that is you have, you know, instead of having uh, called this A, B, C, D, E, and then say over here on the legend, you have A is serum uric acid, B is so on, C is so on they directly label it on the chart. And that's something that we should consider when, when drawing charts. Obviously, if it's impossible, don't try to do it. But um, if it's, it's something easy that you can do, um, I think the Geome Direct, I think there's a direct label package that does this. Uh, they also reduce the number of labels. So they don't write out every single variable. There are other things, right? There are sex, there are race there, but because they don't contribute that much to the, this particular risk of hypertension, they're not showing that. And they just kind of gray that out here. Um, and that gets me to highlighting as well. That's one of the uh, things that we're going to try doing here um, at, at the end of the workshop. Um, also, one more thing is that they use consistent color schemes. So if, you know, uh, red means high and blue means low, they try to keep that throughout their manuscript. And I think that's something uh, important to, to keep in mind. You don't want to flip. This is actually a funny uh, thing because I did uh, spot it. I, I did spot, uh, I think, during the election, Joe Biden at one point was color red and then Trump was color uh, blue. And that was and my, my brain just couldn't handle that <laughs> for some reason. Um, okay, so th those are the key, uh, those are some of the you know, uh, tools that, that we can use to, to reduce the cognitive um, load when we're trying to communicate with charts. Okay, so can someone tell me what is the ggplot terms for these small multiples if we wanna kind of just plot Great. Thank you. Yes. So you're correct. Uh, they call facets. Um, I think small multiples might be a, um, a more general terms and more like kind of informatic. Oh, sorry, not informatic. Infographics um, terminology that other people outside of ggplot uses. Uh, but yes. Yeah, so in ggplot, we use either facet grid or facet grab um, to draw the small multiples. And it's also a great tool to reduce the cognitive burden when you're trying to communicate with charts. And there are some, there are two key things here that I'd like to highlight um, are scales and space. These arguments allow you to decide if you want a fixed axis or um, fixed space or just allow them to have whatever size you want. So this is um, a recent visualization in, in, a, in a submission I've uh, done lately. And <clears throat> if you're not familiar with facets, these are called strips. And so if you go to like theme and things like that, you can say strip element text equals something and that would allow you to access. And if you want to Google, you know, how to make this label in my facet bigger or something, um, the, the keyword here is strips. Um, the space equals freeze allow you to adjust, uh, not sorry, not adjust, but, you know, have as many, uh, the, the, the width here doesn't matter. So it, this can be big and that can be small and um, ggbot allows that. Otherwise it would, you know, it would be, 
really tiny altogether or really big altogether. Uh, the scales equals free argument allow you to have different axes here. So on the y, uh, on the x axis, as you can see, I have on the left here all the sites, and on the right all the uh, country: France, Germany, and USA. Um, so, so yeah, you 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 don't have to have if you don't have scales equals free, you would have all the sites and all the country on the left, and then all the sites and all the country on the right, which is probably not what you want in this case. Um, oh, Chen said scales equal free never worked for me in facet grid. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't, I, you can message me next time you run into a problem and I would love to help. <laughs> um, okay, so back to the point, facets are extremely useful to improve simplicity because they, they, they break things down and, and I'm gonna show you once again more later in um, specific examples when, when we get to the, uh, the exercise part. Okay, so, so we know that our goal is to reduce the country burden. The, all the visualizations is doing is catch a person's eye and, and trying to tell them that this is, you know, this is the key idea and, and you don't have to go through tables of, of numbers anymore. Um, but to be able to do that, you want to identify the key idea that you want to communicate across your chart. And um, the Financial Times has this wonderful vocabulary chart to help you kind of figure out what you want to draw. So if you want to focus on deviation, um, if you want to focus on correlation, if you want to focus on distribution, what are the types of charts that you want to draw? So if you realize scatter plot makes sense for correlation, um, perhaps I think some heat map going on here, this bars um, time component to explain things to, to change over time. So great chart. I highly recommend you check it out. Um, but also, you know, just kind of try to identify what you want to communicate first is really important. Some examples. Okay, so here we're going to get into some pretty bad example. Um, once again, some are mine, some are not. Um, and some some pretty, uh, and, and how my, uh, in, in my personal opinion, um, the, the, it can be improved. So the first one is this chart. Um, on the left here, we see we have two networks. Um, the, the left, so DOL stands for day of life in this particular paper. So we have day of life three versus day of life zero. And on the right, we have day of life seven versus day of life zero. And on the left, I, I don't even know how to explain this chart. I think um, the essentially what this figure is trying to tell you is look from day of life three um, to day of life seven, the, the network gets a lot more dense and there are more nodes. Um, that's about it. Essentially, this is what the text is saying. So, I mean, it's impressive and, and it may look cool, but I feel like there's not much that we can draw from this. So my suggestion would be to um, redraw this in terms of just looking at the number of nodes. And, and yeah, sure, we can, you know, kind of ignore the node size. Um, there's definitely some trade-off that, you know, we won't be able to show the number of edges. Um, but those are the you know, very small number that you can just say in the text and you don't have to um, uh, show, you know, very kind of dense network without particularly to talk about what they, what each of these node means. Um, and once again, you recognize that instead of using a legend here, we could direct label it and see, seeing, uh, using the same color for the text that shows the number of uh, node size. I'm sorry, the number of nodes in a network. And maybe you don't even need to use the DOL abbreviation, especially in presentation. I would highly recommend people to just ignore abbreviation altogether and just say day three versus day zero. People know what you're talking about. This is, you know, for infants, it's their day in day three. So, um, 
and just from the spot, you can immediately show that, okay, there are a lot more nodes um, when you look at day seven versus day zero compared to day three versus day zero. And you can see immediately which, you know, which one, which type of nodes are in, ma making this, are the driver of this increase. Okay, this is another chart um, and bear with me here. It's gonna take me a little bit to explain what this does. Each of these facet, we now know what that's called, is a gene. And the, on the X axis, we have pipeline. So we have 10 pipelines here. Don't worry about what each, what pipeline means for the moment. Um, and on the Y axis, we have the feature importance of that particular gene in the pipeline. Um, and we have that for 16 genes here. So as you can see, um, when I see box plots like this, especially when they all cut a zero, th there's no point of showing them. So maybe we, you know, we don't need to really show these at all um, and instead focus. Oh, and by the way, there's also way too much information in here because this box plot is also showing that, oh, I run this, uh, I think in this case, a hundred times. And this is the feature importance uh, distribution. So lots of information, too much information in, in one chart and really you can't really see, you know, okay, I see that this gene right here is present in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven pipeline, but not, you know, we, we don't know the relative importance of that gene compared to other genes in other pipelines. So an alternative to this would be to look at um, something like this, uh, which is really just a heat map, um, or I, I shouldn't, maybe I shouldn't call it heat map. It's really, I just draw this using geom tile. So on the X axis, we still have pipeline, but on the Y axis, we have the genes now. And I color each of these cells um, based on the pipeline importance of that gene. Um, and then, you know, just connecting them together. And I think this communicates a lot better what was, what, you know, this was doing because we can see now that, okay, pipeline four to 10 looks very similar to each other because they have kind of like picking out the same genes um, versus comparing to the pipeline one, two, three. And yet pipeline one um, have this one gene that they pick out that seem to be really, really important in that pipeline. So think about, you know, what, what we're trying to show. Thanks, Alice. Alice is saying this is a really nice example. Um, there's more coming. So uh, this is another example of, uh, we, we need to think about what we want to say. Uh, on each of these facets here, um, we have different number, different value for our abs. So our abs here is 0 0.09, 0 0.11, 0 0.15, 0 0.21. So it seems like it's improving, it's increasing, right? And we're trying to see what the relationship between the uncorrelated data distribution is compared to that of the correlated data. Um, what's being drawn here is the density plot, but also the, I believe, yes, mean and standard deviation. So standard mean is in dash line, standard deviation is in dot line. Um, and the purple and the orange um, can be very close together. It's really hard to see. And an alternative is this plot. Does anyone know the name of this kind of plot? Ridge plot, yes, yes. Oh no. <laughs> um, Van is saying that when, when you see your paper fix on blast and trang slide, it's not, it's not yours, I know. <laughs> yes, this is called bridge plot or joy plot. And uh, yes, you can use geom rich. Uh, I think it's a package. Um, yeah, to, to draw this. And it makes it a lot better to, or at least to me, I, I think it, it shows a lot better where uncorrelated data is. And you can still see that, you know, it's, it's, it's stayed quite constant throughout. However, the correlated data would change as, 
are in, increases. And that's really, and, and you know, it's, the mean is shifting to the left and also the standard deviation is getting bigger. That's all we wanted to say. So this, this plot would communicate that a lot better than what was, has been shown before. Uh, maybe dumb question, but <laughs> no dumb question here, Allison. Um, how exactly is GeoBridge different than fill density plot? Yes, excellent question. So it's it's not that different. Um, the way, however, the way that these are stacked on top of each other are slightly different. So you can it allows for this kind of overlap. Does that make sense? Um, Whereas, yes, I can definitely draw this with just facets, but then they, they, won't, uh, they, they won't overlap. Yeah. Oops. Uh, okay, so another plot here. This is actually not too bad. Um, and this is from the paper. I'm just gonna link it here. Uh, Basic statistical consideration for physiology. It's actually a great paper. Um, they are trying to show well, they, they show a lot of things, but exactly in this picture, they try and show that if you have a pre-post analysis, like if if these two observations are related to each other, um, maybe draw a line between the points, and uh, then also show the difference between the, the 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 points from before and after as well. I would go one step above this, um, beyond this, to ignore the the box plot altogether because there's no we're not when you know if you do a t-test here it's just going to be a pair of t-tests which is going to just looking at the difference here so so we we don't really need that box plot uh statistics at all and this is an example um this is a this is a different completely different data this more than five points here but um what I'm trying to show is that, yeah, you may have a lot of points, but you can still um, draw these lines and, and show that, okay, in most of the cases, model B, in this case, I'm comparing two models instead of pre-post, model B is better than model A. Um, that's all. So, some, yeah, so, and, and the, I guess the connection between this right-hand plot um, instead of doing instead of drawing just points and box plots you can, you can just show density plot like this and then um, turn it 90 degrees <clears throat> okay um this is actually a plot that i was really proud at when uh, proud of when when it got published um what i'm trying to do here show here is each of these uh each group is an individual and uh, they were scanned three times, and I predict uh, their age based on their uh, brain, their uh, structural MRI image. Um, and in each time, they, they were given either placebo or 200 milligrams of ibuprofen or 600, 600 milligrams of ibuprofen. Um, but there were still things that can be improved here. So, for example, I noticed that the uh, chronological age here um, is not the same. The scale on the x-axis is not the same as the scale on the y-axis, so that can be improved. Um, this line is way too dark here. I didn't need that to be so prominent. And uh, 200 milligram versus 600 milligrams, maybe instead of using the shape, I can make it a smaller and a bigger circle, a uh, fill circle, and then the placebo would just remain the same. So this is the, the, the end product, essentially. We have, you know, once again, I fix it so that I want to make sure that the, the scales here are, um, and you can do this, which I'm going to show in a little bit, with chord fix, ratio one. Um, and as I said, 200, 200 milligrams is just a smaller circle and 600 milligrams would be a bigger circle. Um, yes, it is theme black white, um, because once again, I'm, in academia. So most of these plots are just <laughs> uh, theme black white all the way. And you can do that with theme set, which I'm going to show you in a little bit. Um, okay, so I'm at 643. I'm going to actually skip this part. Um, but 
I just want to say one sentence here. You, you have the link to the slide, so you can go here and you can explore um, this, this protocol as much as possible. But one thing that I'm going to mention is that we are the one who decide how much information we want to show. So, um, you know, as a scientist, you can show as much, say I have five data points. Um, don't draw a box plot, just show the five data points, you know. Um, but if I have, say, 100 data points, I think it would make sense to show a box plot, a violin plot, bee swarm, however you want to show it. But, um, you know, you're, you're, you're in charge of it. And so you, you decide how, how much you want to show. Um, okay, so this is a fun topic. Um, to me, because I, I love presentation, I love doing a lot of presentation, and but my papers are, you know, I have my own figures for the paper, and then oftentimes I regenerate the, a slightly different version for the presentation. So I'm curious if people do this, and if so, why, and what do you think would be different um, between paper and presentation? Um, Camilla said yes all the time. Things need to be black and white. Oh, oh, that's a, yeah, that's an interesting, yeah, grayscale. Bigger font site in presentation. Thank you, Eva. Yes. Uh, seems like. Communication, presentation. Yes, show less because you can explain exactly and, and um, perfect, more appealing in the eye. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I mean, no, I'm, I'm totally with you. I like to make my plot as pretty as possible, but um, seems like you can get more creative. Yeah, you can add, you know, animation, um, emojis. You don't have to be as uh, serious. Animate. Thank you, Alice. Yes. Yeah, information. But, you have lots loose people totally Camilla yes so that's the amount of information once again right um what Camilla just said um the amount of information you want to put in the paper um is very different than the amount of information that you want to put on a, on a presentation um um Oh, and nobody mentioned this, but annotation can can be important. You can you know draw arrows. I guess yeah, you can be less kind of uh, formal. Um, you may want to highlight certain things that you want to show them. And uh, I, I mentioned about the day of life thing earlier. Instead of DOL, maybe just do day one or day zero. Just ignore all the abbreviation if you can, because in the t in the paper you you would do. Um, you, you would have, you know, uh, your abbreviation explained in the main text, but um, you don't have that in the presentation. You can utilize animation or builds, um, text sizes, someone mentioned that. Those are great reasons. And I'm going to show you um, just one quick uh, work that I did recently analyzing the composition of PubMed authors and see how that compares to people who are being invited to speak at uh, ISCB, which is a, bi a computational biology related conference. And so in the X axis here, I have year from uh, 98 to uh, 2019. And on the Y axis, I have the estimate composition and being highlighted here is um, composition of authors that are who are predicted to be white now contrasting this this is among PubMed authors contrasting this with iscb fellows and keynote speakers we see that white centers are overrepresented and it's being highlighted now in green and we see asian scientists and we once again see a big difference except the the sign is flipped now and we see that asian scientists are underrepresented in these conferences um, and we don't do we didn't have enough data to do the rest. So again, I kind of utilize what I learned from these principles about um, highlighting and about um, animation and kind of allow that to, uh, you know, not showing everything at first, but kind of reveal step by step and allow guiding the, uh, the, the audience through my through my um, visualization. 
Okay, um, we talked a little bit about annotation. Um, I wanted to show, and this is this is a little bit kind of out of academia because I feel like may, maybe unless you do, um, I'm, I'm more in a dry lab environment, so um, maybe it's different elsewhere. But we we don't do a lot of annotation in our own kind of visualization that we put in the paper, but. I still think, you know, for, for journaling, for um, even just presentation, it's, I think it's really, really helpful to um, put annotation in there. So um, once again, it's a financial uh, times graphic. I'm a big fan um, of these things. And this is a great figure, but say, I, I don't really want to know, you know, I don't really want to see, read in to see what the Y axis is and the X axis is, then I can, um, but there's the annotation here shows okay down here is more deaths and large economic hit so this is something related to covid i already kind of suspected that but we have that and then we have the other annotation for other corners as well we have more deaths here and small economic hit fewer deaths here fewer deaths there and large economic hit so on and so forth so annotation the next layer is then saying, okay, many Asian countries fare relatively well in both metrics. So they're highlighting, as you can see, you hi they're highlighting the Asian countries that fare relatively well, um, have fewer deaths and a uh, small economic hit. And then finally, the, the title is important in the sense that um, it is not, you know, the title here wasn't, cumulative deaths per million versus fall in GDP or the other way around. They don't just describe, they um, tells you what the graphic is trying to tell you. So what it says here, countries that were unable to control the outbreaks have tended to suffer the most economic pain. Um, so that's that's how you communicate, <laughs> that's how you help aid, right, um, the communication of the, of the infographics. Um, this is a great uh, example also once again for annotation. Um, the blog is by Isabella. She, I, I highly uh, recommend you check out her blog. Um, but this is she. She did all these nice um, annotation on this plot of uh, she called it my life in months. And so you have uh, probably her birth month here and then going through all the months in each year um, at age 10, what did she do uh, age 20, college adulting, moving back to US, so on and so forth. And um, so, yeah, so just kind of pointing to, you know, and once again, this is a great example of direct labeling instead of having out here, you have, oh, orange is high school, um, light orange is college. She directly labeled it here, which I found very um, direct. Um, there's this incredible package called GG Annotate that allows you to just highlight a piece of code and uh, draw the arrow or whatever add text and whatever things you want into your plot. And then it would generate the code to do that. And you can just copy and paste that into your, um, in this case, they just add layer, as you can see, and it would plot the, the, the final plot for you. So it kind of combines this, um, uh, what, what I like about it is it's reproducible. Um, and, but then you don't have to spend that much time to try to figure out like where exactly should my arrow be here and, um, you know, take like time and just try an arrow to move it around. So. Um, great package. Okay, so let's go to some useful ggplot snippets. Um, I use Flipbook R to make this the first time this weekend, so um, hopefully you guys like it. Uh, this is a Tidy Tuesday data set from a few weeks ago on mobile subscription of different country, and uh, I've cleaned this mobile data set data frame for you already. It has five columns of different country that is this column is called entity gdp per capita, um oh, capita mobile subscription total population and the last column is continent that's not shown and i didn't have time to put it here um so 
what are we going to do? We're going to walk through each of my ggplot uh, line of code, and then um, I'd like to spend a little bit of time on discussing what they do. Um, I know that this may be a, a little bit easy for some of you, but I think it's important to, you know, just understand what 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 they do and and how the graph changes because of it. So the first line is just defining the x and the y axis. So that's you know where this is heading. Um, this data set, by the way, uh, remind me immediately of the Gapminder data set. So if you work with that, you 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 kind of have seen this this um, similar graphics before of how how all the dots are moving. Um, but anyhow, so on the x-axis we have GDP per capita. On the y-axis we have the proportion or the yeah the proportion of mobile subscription and adding geom point adds all of these points here. Um, so you can see that it's, um, oh, and this year, I think this is, I, I said it to be 2010. So the year is 2010. And this is the, um, each dot is a country. And um, it shows, you know, for which, for a country, what is this country, this country's GDP and what's the um, mobile subscriptions. For that particular country and um, it curves up a little bit. Um, something I learned recently is that you can adjust, uh, you can add this aesthetic just by itself, um, which is nice because now I can just add, um, I'm gonna make the size of these points the representative of the total population and I'm gonna make the color be the continent. So that's what's happened here. So up here, we did not have any, earlier we did not have any color. Now we have colors and now we have size. So um, I think that looks pretty good. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I like to use colorblind friendly palettes. And um, this is a great function just to add to your, um, it's an easy add to your ggplot. It's um, scale color colored. And then D is for discrete because my continent is not a continuous variable, it's a discrete variable. So once again, as you can see earlier, you have a different kind of just the base color um, in the base, basic color black palette in ggplot, um, adding color cardo, um, make it a little bit different. Uh, to hide, so I realized that this right here doesn't really give me that much information, the total population size legend here. So what I did is I just hide it by calling scale size continuous guy equals false. <clears throat> and by now you probably recognize that, oh, I can do scale with everything. So scale X, scale color, scale size, scale fill, um, scale Y, and, and anything that you know, is a is a layer of graphics, and you can add to this, um, and you can just hide it by guy equals false. Um, from here, I I I mean it's fine, but I don't like the fact that you know all the points is kind of to the left of the plot here. Um, maybe there's a better uh, rescaling for the ax axis that I can do. Um, and indeed, yes, you can easily do scale x log ten, and that's already built in. Um, you can do scale x continuous and then make your own transformation function within the scale x uh, continuous function as well. But um, log 10 is just already built in, so it's easy. And another thing that I do here is using label equals dollar format. As you can see, GGPlot really thought, thought really you know, a lot about what formats are here. And if I want my format to be in dollar sign and then a comma, um, after the first three digit from the right, then it does that for you. Um, so labels equals dollar format. And then scale Y continuous. Um, what did I do here? Oh, I do percent format. So instead of dollar format, because I know my mobile subscription. So this is an important um, point. So let me just go back. Here, my mobile subscription is going from zero to two. By doing late percent format, it just go from zero to 200. So you don't have to worry too much about um, uh, 
you know, transforming this multiply by 100 or something like that. I generally don't myself, I don't like multiplying proportion by 100 because it changes the data. And then maybe later I forgot about I have the fact that I have already changed this to 100. And so then they multiply by 100 or something. So anyway, the, the least amount of um, transformation you can do on your data that possible, um, that the better. So um, if you can just change the label, change the label. Um, okay, and then to add labels, um, earlier everything is just kind of basic here. You have GDP, you have mobile subscription, you have continent here. I just changed it to, okay, make my x-axis label GDP and then y-axis mobile subscription, make it look nice. And then this is one thing that I highly recommend you do if your label is if continent continent here doesn't really help with anything i know that africa is a continent i know that europe is a continent I, I didn't need you know some some graphic to tell me that these are continents so um maybe yeah maybe just do color equals null and that would just um that essentially uh remove that that the title of the legend of the label of the legend for you okay and then i add theme minimal just because I like the white background. Um, I do theme black white a lot like um, someone mentioned earlier and uh, um, yeah and then you can add other things to it too. So you can add pin or grid equals element blank, um, legend position equals top so that your graphics span wide, um, things like that. But one thing that I do want to mention here is that if you do the theme, if you do these two last line first and then you add theme minimal, it will, the theme minimal will override what you have written before. So whichever base theme you want to use, use that first and then later define the, the theme after. So um, just something that took me like a long time to figure out five years ago. <laughs> Okay, I think. Okay, so this is slightly different. Um, I want to touch real quick on GG Highlight because I think it's a wonderful package that, um, uh, yeah, I, I just want I just want you to know about it. And um, they're basically to, to to me there are two basic ways of using GG Highlight. You could either put a condition in mobile subs. Um, I'm sorry, put a condition with, as, as the first argument in GG Highlight. So in this case, I want to see which country have um, mobile subscription larger than 170%. And so it would, it would highlight these for you. Um, a little bit too small, but um, all they wanted to show here is that that's the first use. The second use um, of GG Highlight that you can do is you can do a facet wrap and then you can um, add GG Highlight. And what this does, as you can see, is that it will break this into each different facet and then it would highlight, it would gray out every other continent and only, uh, sorry, gray out countries and other continents and only highlight the countries in that particular, particular continent in your facet grab, uh, wrap. So, um, maybe I would change the, um, the color here in, um, yeah, the, the, the gray here just really blend in together. So maybe you want to change that color um, and not use the, the Carter color that I used before. Okay. Um, right. So I mentioned briefly this earlier. Um, you can use theme set at the beginning of your script to make sure that you don't have to do all of these you know, plus theme minimal later if you want. Um, and the way to do that is to um, do theme set, the minimal, plus um, whatever other kind of default method you want to your theme to have. So I, what I often like is once again, I don't often have legend, the title. So I just kind of set that equal element blank. And then um, I, I don't like the, the grid, the, the minor grid line either. So I, I often set that panel grid minor as element blank as well. But once again, this is just a way for you to set whatever default you like. Um, GG plot. Oh, I was like, GG plot. What am I going to show here? Um, okay, add null. Um, I love this because 
when you add null to the end, um, you can still print everything, nothing changes here. But what you can do is you can comment out any line in between, including the last line. So if I want to, I can comment out this last line and it would still work. And I don't have to like go back up here and delete this, this uh, uh, plus sign if I don't want to. So um, just some trick there. Uh, same thing for piping as well. I love doing this when, you know, when I first just exploring the um, what transformation, what tidying do I need to do with my data frames? I just kind of pipe that to um, this uh, curly braces dot curly braces. And what that does is that I can just comment out the last line right before it if I really want to, um, instead of having to go back and, and like delete the pipe operator. Thanks, Camilla. Um, okay, so one more thing. Um, briefly touched on this earlier, but um, the same data set we have before, uh, Tidy Tuesday mobile subscription data set, um, but on the y axis now, oh, I have mobile subscription on the x axis and land, landline subscription on the y axis. This spot seems fine, right? Um, but what, it's, what you haven't we really see is that the ratio is is not quite correct um, and I think it's fair if, if you and I changed the plot because I wanted to show you that the the axes um, if, if in this case is percentage then then you may you know want to show that it's uh, they, they align well so what I often do if I have things that I want to compare like this is I use chord fix ratio equals one. And what that does is that it would make sure that, you know, this zero to 120 here is the same um, as zero to the 120 here. So that, you know, we, we have a, a better idea of, uh, you know, how, how the mobile subscription compared to the landline subscription in this particular uh, year, 2010. Okay. Um, one, I think this may be one of the last thing that I want to um, show, same data set, but instead of um, looking at these scatter plots, now I have a map. And if you do map, um, GeoMSF is a great uh, tool. And what I would highly recommend you do is using this equal earth projection. Um, it's a recent projection that um, I think gives this very nice and proportional um, area to different countries in the world. And um, it doesn't put, you know, the US right in the center. If, if you want to look at the world, I think you, you should look at the whole world rather than putting the US very big in the center. Um, yeah, so highly recommend Equal Earth. Um, and again, you can just copy this code, it should work. Okay, um, I'll, I'll do a quick pause before um, the next, set of, of slides here, if there's any questions. I know I'm already going a little bit over. Jake said, I just wish chord fix or theme worked better with dates and facets to keep the ratios consistent. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't really used uh, chord fix on dates yet. Um, yeah, it would be interesting to see how how good it works. But yeah, you would think that with all the transformation, it should be pretty clear. Um, any other questions? Hi, Chang. Yeah, um, so we, we did have a couple of questions. Um, one of them was about the black and white theme and um, whether that's customary in academia and I think why. Oh, that's a great question. Um, it, it kind of is, I don't love it, uh, but it seems that um, we don't, uh, you know, I, I think oftentimes in, in uh, you know, these, these papers that, uh, okay, in news, the way where you read it, and, you know, they focus more on the aesthetics and perhaps they would remove more of the, uh, the grid lines and things like that. Whereas in academia, um, reviewers and readers in general like to see that, you know, where exactly everything is. And so maybe more the, the grid lines, you know, help with um, uh, just 
seeing that correlate the, 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 the actual data point to the number better. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, and the default is just gray, which is not that great when you actually do print out of academic papers. Um, that, 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 that would be my guess. Thanks. And then um, another question was about general principles that you follow when plotting. Um, I guess all of this. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I think, yeah, I, I would say one, one thing is when, when I represent some plot um, to my, the, one of my old advisors, the first thing we would say, what are you trying to show here? And sometimes like, I, I used to stutter because I, I don't know. I'm like, well, it shows what it shows. <laughs> um, but I think if, yeah, I think you have to have a message. If, if you just, you know, have a, a data set and then you want to plot something, that's fine. Um, but, you know, once I think it evolves, right? So, so you're trying to figure out, you're exploring the data, you're trying to figure out what patterns it, there is and when you find the pattern i think that's where you want to show it and that's where you your message is um yeah so i, I think identifying the message is one of the most important part of of the making charts is that all great and then um I think one one last question about recommended resources for um, mapping in R, and actually a quick plug for our past R Ladies Philly workshop on that. Um, I would have to check when this was, um, but well, why don't I check that quickly? And Chang, <laughs> I'll let you answer. Yeah, I, I don't have a good question for that either. So yeah, um, if if you could find that and then put that in the in the Google Doc, that'd be great. Um, okay. That's all. If that's all, like I will continue. And I know that I'm already a little bit over time, but um, I'm almost done toward the end. So, um, okay, just very quick about null and false and NA and element blank. And I, I know that it's, you know, not super straightforward and it's hard to remember sometimes, but these are if just things that you have to, I mean, not you have to, but uh, it's just nicer and faster for you if you remember this. So um, if say I don't want to show my y-axis label um, or I don't want my um, fill label that then, uh, or the title, you know, the, the legend title, then I used to do this. I used to do just plus labels, uh, plus labs, y equals empty string, fill was empty string, but, um, I think a better way to do it is um, plus lab y equals null field was null because this way that because because technically the empty string is still taking up space and so when you actually do empty string um, the the border of the plot is actually lower than where you want it to be because um, you want you know you want your plot to just take up as much space as possible in that particular thing so anyway um yeah so so use null instead of instead of empty string if you want that. Um, and once again, this is also equivalent to um, adding it in the theme. So you can just say axis title dot y equals element blank. Everything in theme has to be element something. So um, it could be element text, it could be element rect. Um, but if you want things to be empty, you want to use element blank in theme. Um, same thing here. We show we kind of talked about this earlier. We had we had a scale, maybe color earlier, or a scale fill, um, continuous uh, to hide the. If you remember, the, oh, we used scale size earlier. We hide the size legend. So to hide that, you, you use guide equals false. Alternatively, you could do plus guides fill equals false. Um, and NA can be used to set limits. Um, I used to do limits, or I just add limbs, x equals something, y equals something. Um, NA just means that there's, there's no limit, just, you know, wherever you, wherever you plot these dice to be the max, um, slightly larger than the data, use that. Um, and 
but I, I went to Jake's, uh, Jake Riley's um, talk, I think at Our Ladies last year in the summer. So yeah. Uh, and uh, I learned that that's not, that's not necessarily, that may not be what you want because when you do ad limbs, it strip out that, that those points completely. And then it calculate, you know, the other uh, statistics using only the leftover point. So if, you, you do geom smooth or if you're trying to calculate uh, um, box plot or things like that it it, it only calculate it only uses the the the, the things that stepped over which is oftentimes not what you want so alternatively what i would do is using chord cartesian and define x limb and y limb um, instead of using limbs so yes it's very helpful and and check out um jake also has other visualization talks on youtube um i highly recommend it if you um want a little bit more on like the ggplot side and less on the principal side um yeah it, it, and he's a great he's a great speaker too so um it's important to know the differences between these things um geom call geom bar geom histogram I'm just gonna leave it here. Um, okay, I'll, I'll say one thing about it. So geom call is actually drawing the point um, that you want it to draw. So it actually takes in x and y, whereas geom bar, let's say you just give it x, it would count um, the 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 value for the y, and then it would um, it would kind of be like geom histogram, but bin equals one, whereas geom histogram um, grabs you know, count counts all the points in, in, in between and it determines the bins by itself and everything. Um, so just, you know, read a little bit of documentation on that. Um, similarly, learn about geom point versus geom count um, and see what the differences are there. Um, one thing that I would um, also want to highlight here is geom jitter. Actually, jitter is both in the X and the Y direction by default. Um, and this is this is something that I guess now that I, I write it down, it makes sense. But at the time when I was trying to plot things and, and I just wanted, you know, things that are on, everything is just on this one like kind of axis and I just want them to jitter a little bit on the side. Um, and I just use geom jitter without defining any other argument. It would actually do it, it both ways. And um, oftentimes that's not what I want. So. Just make sure you check the arguments out for this. Um, I think it's height and width where, where you want it to jitter. So um, yeah, it's just something to keep in mind. Very quickly on colors, make sure you understand um, what if, if, if you want to um, color something that is a color variable that is divergent or sequential or quantitative. Um, and I highly recommend just the already you know, established colorblind friendly palettes out there in our um, we have uh, the Viridis scale, which I love for continuous variables. It also has discrete, but I don't often use discrete for um, for for quantitative. Or, I often don't use Viridis for quantitative uh, color palettes. Um, and once again, um, you can do scale color or scale fill here, and everything would work similarly. Uh, okay, so for categorical variables, I like to use either the colorblind R package or the R color cardo package, and we used this earlier in the mobile subscription example. Jake also has this amazing package called Simple Colors. I highly recommend you check out. Um, wonderful vignettes, and it explains really well um, what essentially what what options what saturation what hue what light the the lightness you want um, and yeah so I highly recommend check it out instead of having to go through this you know um, this this is actually from simple colors but if you remember there's something similar in um, for for base R and but it's just like kind of everywhere and and it's not um, as it doesn't make sense. So simple colors make sense. Um, so yeah, just 
check it out if you want to do, uh, especially for like divergent or if you want to plot something from zero to a hundred and you want your high color to be a certain color and then you want your zero to be say white, then um, yeah, you can just define these colors using um, say TO3 and it would do it for you. Okay. Um, here are all the resources. I have a few more slides, but um, all of them are here just for references. I'd like to um, start the uh, exercise now. The, it's going to be your turn. And uh, what I've asked for today is to reproduce this amazing Financial Times graphic by um, John Byrne Murdoch. And I think most of the other graphics that I just showed earlier is also by John. Um, but yeah, uh, he's great. And um, he also had a recent talk on um, at the, uh, what is it, NHS community or our community uh, workshop or sorry, conference. Uh, and I highly, check, uh, I highly recommend checking that out as well. So anyway, we're going to do this, except this was produced in April and we're going to use the latest uh, COVID data set to um, expand this plot until today. So uh, you're gonna you're gonna make something like this, and uh, yeah. So let's head over to the R Studio. I give everyone a little bit of time to have that open up. Um, if you go to the Google Doc, I apologize for uh, some of the. People in my house are cooking, so if that's too loud, I'm sorry. Um, but anyways, the the Google Doc, if you if you would head to the Google Doc, the R Studio Cloud link is there. I can also just re put this in the chat now. Um, you can also see in the chat the link Jake posted for Simple Colors there, um, and. We'll give people a few more, a uh, couple more minutes to do this. But if you, if you were able to open our Studio Cloud, uh, if you could go to Tools, Global Options, R Markdown, and uncheck the Show Output in Live, that would be great. Thanks so much, Chang. Um, whilst people are kind of switching over, we did have one question about um, how you made the slides. How I make these slides? Uh, great questions. It's on, uh, it's just slides.com. I started using it um, maybe one or two years ago. I think it's great. Um, and what I was able to do with that. So, so yes, yeah, uh, sorry, let me just back up. Slides.com, it's free. You can, I think if you have a paid version, you can export it as PDF and things like that. Um, it has some very basic, uh, you know, just text file, I'm sorry, text boxes and um, code boxes, math boxes, which are nice. Um, but it has this incredible uh, thing called iframe. And what, what it allows me to do was um, the, the flip book earlier, I was actually linking from, uh, so, so I generate the flipbook as an HTML, and I was able to link that HTML into slides using the iframe feature of slides.com. So um, yeah, check it out. The, the only thing that was, um, luckily it did not happen to me, but over the summer, I think a lot of people were using slides.com and you know, giving presentations and things like that, and it just crashed one morning, and it did not, it was down for like, seven hours or something that day and everyone was freaking out because they had talks to do and um so yeah that's the risk that you know we would have to take when we put everything on the cloud and it can crash but um yeah i mean if, if you have the paid version which i don't think is that much maybe five dollars a month um you can export it as PDF and just make you know have an archive on on your own on your own machine. Um, yeah, <laughs> always download a version. I know Carla. I I live on the edge here. <laughs> I noticed that you can copy the code. Yeah, 
yeah, the, the code boxes are really nice um, here. And I mean, I, I like, um, and I can't ever, I can't ever um, pronounce this right, Jeringen, um, but it, and, and I, you know, I use that for the flipbook R, but I think it, it just takes me too much time I know how to spell it, Martine. I just don't know how to say it. <laughs> um, yeah, it is, but it, it, with like the perfectionist in me, I, I just can't use it because it takes, you know, it, I would like have to do so much just to tweak a very little detail thing. Um, so I, it, I did find it really nice to make the flip book, but um, yeah, the slides, just the drag and drop is a lot share sharing um okay <laughs> thanks Jack. Oh, we'll, we'll have to talk in person later <laughs> and i i know sylvia also um can can, can like in hand okay <laughs> sylvia did give a really nice uh i wasn't able to watch the whole workshop but um she did also at nhs community or our community uh, conference she did give a I think two day workshop on um, making slides uh, using Jeringen. So, uh, or Jeringen Extra. So um, yeah, if, if you're interested in that, I, I highly recommend checking it out. Um, I, I, I just like the drag and drop and just very quickly, you know, putting things together. And, and I, I also like the fact that I, I was able to see it right away. I think that's one of the most um, important thing for me to make these slides. So. Okay, uh, so hopefully everyone get your our studio cloud up. I, unless there's any other questions. Okay, uh, okay. So what I wanted you guys to do was to uncheck this box here, show output in live or mark out our documents because then we just showed it like right below the code. But I think it's best if we can just see the plot on the side here. So make sure that this box is unchecked. And once again, the way that I got here is by uh, go to tools, global options, and R markdown, and then I uncheck that box. All right, so just make sure that's unchecked, and then you should be good to go. If this is your first time in R markdown, welcome um, to run a line of code. Place your cursor in that line and then do command enter. Um, and if, and this is called a chunk. So if you see like this tick here, um, that just indicating that, okay, I'm starting an R chunk. And then to run chunk in um, a, a whole chunk of code, then you can just place a cursor inside it and then do command shift enter. Um, but that is just for your sake. Uh, um, if you want to go fast, I'm just, I think what I'm going to try to do is just to do, um, run current chunk here. Okay. And then to ask what a function does, just put a question mark before the function name. So for example, if you do question mark mean, um, it would show you over here that, okay, um, mean, what does what a function does do? Okay. So let's go down here. I already installed all of this for, for you, so you don't have to um, uh, do much. I Some lengthier scripts I put in utils.r. Um, if you're curious, you can check it out. Oh, and by the way, if you're not familiar with our studio uh, over here, you have the file structure and stuff. You can click on things if you want. You can go back to the main project by hitting this. I learned this from watching um, Jenny Bryan's, uh, one of her uh, talk. She, she just clicked this and then all, all of a sudden it went back to the main project. So that was pretty great. I didn't know that because I I'd always kind of like have to navigate back. But anyhow, um, the, the R Markdown script we're working on is COVID dash data viz. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of things are in here, but some of the theme, like uh, the FT theme and uh, um, this one vector I put in utils.r because it's longer and I didn't want to distract you from the rest of it. But other than that, um, 
yeah, let's get started. So let's load these packages. What I just did was command shift enter and everything is loaded. Uh, you can see in your environment what variables has been here and that's just one variable that I have um, loaded from utils.r. Let's go down and I had run this uh, update data set line earlier, so you don't have to do it. Essentially, just update the data until today. So, um, and coronavirus, by the way, is a very nice package that has um, just updated coronavirus, uh, COVID cases and deaths um, every day. And so now, as you can see, uh, if you print out the head of coronavirus data frame, you, you see that this data frame has date, um, province seems to be empty, it has country, latitude, longitude, um, type, type in here would have confirmed or death, I believe, and then the number of cases. Okay, so then We'll do some exploring here. Um, we'll choose a few, you can choose a few countries to plot if you want, or you can choose if you want to really um, uh, reproduce that graphics that I showed earlier, you can just do this. That would be your selected country. Command enter there. Um, and then this whole data frame, I'm oh, sorry, this whole chunk right here is just to compute the moving average COVID data frame. And uh, once again, as I show you here, you can pipe this into just uh, braces dot braces and um, it, you don't have to do it. I just wanted to show you that, but um, it would allow you to, you know, comment out this last line if you want. So, okay, so let's run this chunk. Uh, chunk. So now in your environment, you should see that you have your moving COVID, average COVID here. Oh, by the way, an, another cool thing that I learned recently is if you hold down the command button, or is that what you call it? Yeah, a command button, and then click on the data frame here, it views it for you. So there you go, instead of having to go to, um, environment and, and look for that data frame, you can just command down and then click on that. So uh, yeah, so once again, we see dates, country, total death, weekly moving average. Um, ID here is just something that I, I have, so don't worry about that too much. Dates. Um, okay, so let's run this chunk and see what happens. <laughs> that sounds like someone our studio cloud is being very angry. Okay, so what's happened here? Um, why it it doesn't it doesn't look quite like what we want, right? Um, everything is kind of connected, um, and this has happened to me so many times. Can someone tell me why what's happening here? What why is ggplot doesn't recognize the country? Grouping, yes. No group, yes. So we want grouping because otherwise it doesn't know which one to connect it to. Exactly. This, it just connects all the points together. There's no, um, well, I think there's a ranking, right? So there's a date ranking, but then it doesn't group any countries together. So the way to do that is within ggplot, you do, oh, and I didn't even explain what I was trying to draw here, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> The x axis are the dates, and then the y axis we're trying to um, plot here is the weekly moving average value of the number of deaths. Um, yes, the number of deaths per per week, or sorry, per day. But then I, I take a, a seven day average. Okay, so aesthetics um, in. So that's your x, x equals date, y equals week moving average, and then um, group equals country. 
So if you do this, you run this chunk, let's see what we have. Okay, so we have some things. We have some very um, high peak at first, and then down low, and um, some others. You can probably guess what that one is. Um, but right now, we can't really tell which country is which. Um, error in the data below zero. Yes, there is error in the data. Um, excellent point. I did not even notice that earlier. <laughs> so we'll, we will see what happened. Um, you could go, we could go back and, and um, remove that point. My recommendation for, for this particular case would be to go back to the original data set and see what's going on there um, instead of just like blindly removing it. Um, but for, for this purpose, uh, for this particular workshop, let's just move on. Um, and there'll, there'll be more related question after that too. So, but thanks for pointing that out, Martine. Okay, so let's run this next chunk uh right now we can't really tell which country is which but if we try color um all we see is if i maybe i could zoom out a little bit i had it there okay um but still it's not super helpful right because uh we have too many, way too many colors. There's no way that I can tell the difference between Indonesia and Iran right now. So, um, oh, play button. I never knew that. Thank you. I always use it. Thank you, Kyra. Kyra oh, wait. Yeah. Thank you for, for um, pointing out this. And I think I knew it, but I never used it. So thanks. Um, OK, so I will just press this play button to run the current chunk. Um, Okay, so how about we highlight only a few countries? And we, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, right? We have GG highlight, and in GG highlight, we can just add in a condition. Um, so in this case, we'll highlight US and uh, South Korea, see what is going on. Uh, okay, so it's doing some, it has some warning here. Um, from Gigi Highlight, it's saying falling back to ungroup filter operation. Um, try to calculate by group by. Don't worry about that for now. Uh, There's a long conversation after that. But uh, just ignore the warning. Uh, trust me and ignore the warning for now. Um, so we could do highlights like this, um, or we could also do uh, use facets or small multiples like we discussed earlier. So if we run that chunk, could not find function uh did you run the original um if, if you cannot find the the pipe that it's very likely that you have not run this chunk um the first the very first chunk to set up and call the library so i i, I what i would do um to debug is to do, go to session and restart R um, and then just rerun everything again. And if you don't want to click each button um, over and over, you can just do run uh, all chunks above. Thanks, thanks, Kyra. Yes, thank you. Okay, hopefully that helps, let me know. Okay, so where were we? Um, we were doing facets. So, okay, so we were down here um, we say, okay, we can plot each country at, in its own facets. Um, and that's fine, but we can't really compare, you know, the countries together. And um, once again, we will utilize GG Highlight one more time, but instead of having a, uh, a condition within GG Highlight, what we're going to do is um, it looks like Spain had negative, had the negative value. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we'll go to Spain after and see what's going on there. Um, in uh, what is it, June? Yeah, around June, late May. Okay, so I just ran the facet wrap. 
with G highlight. And as you can see, what it's doing now is plotting everything in gray except the country that is being highlighted. So I think that's that's quite nice. Um, okay, so we're here. And the exercises for you would be to add um, scale Y log 10 to see what that does and if we like that or not. Uh, examine the scale X date um, to see if we can adjust the X ticks to break every two months rather than uh, three months right now. Um, I have also a thing about breaking at even uh, locations rather than odd um, because that you know allows your minor break to be at the whole point rather than uh, like mid-May. Um, maybe you can add the FC theme and then um, you know just go through all of this and you can go crazy with it as well and I want to see your final plot if you could if you finish and you know wherever you are, if you just finished the first two exercises, you can um, stop there. Uh, and but anyway, I, I I like to see everyone's charts at the end. So if you if you finish and if you could drag your final charts in um, this Google Drive folder that is put in line two forty, that would be really appreciated. Um, and I'll I'll go there and see if anyone's add anything. Uh, Kelsey said, I actually use this data set to teach something early this summer. There's a GitHub issue on the negative values. It's not a mistake because ca cases isn't the new cases for the day. It's the change in cases from the day before or something like that. Thank you for this, Kelsey. I'll, I'll take a look. Um, very interesting. The power of, oh, I don't want that. GitHub issues. And yeah, once again, ask me any questions. If you have any, if you want to go crazy with your plot, if you want to have a lot of different colors, please feel free. Um, if you want to uh, make different themes. Where do we upload the image? It's um, on that last, if you scroll down, um, or it's also in the Google Doc as well. So, if, but if you scroll down to this line, um, line 240, you'll see it. The R Studio never loaded for me, so I just washed it. Does anyone know how to troubleshoot? Um, Catherine, can you explain more why it, so, so did you save it into your own workspace? I it, did. Uh, so it's in your workspace and it just kind of has the preparing project loading thing. Um, but then it just kind of sits there on the loading screen and never goes to the code. Huh. I, I don't know if maybe anyone else had seen a similar issue or if maybe I should try creating a new space. Yeah. So it's in your personal workspace. Yes. Huh. Um, yeah, yeah. Kara is saying that I've had our studio cloud hang sometimes too. This it should not hang here though because this project is not that big. So I don't know why that is the case. Um, maybe use incognito uh, on your browser. Uh, you mean I should try using incognito? Yeah. Hmm. Okay, I'll give it a shot. Okay, sorry, I'm not, yeah. Uh, okay, huh, I, yeah, I'm not, can you set anywhere? Uh, as you're working when importing files. Um, uh, Courtney asked, can you set anywhere as your working directory when importing files? I, 
you can i advise a game setting working directory because um i think a project should be contained and if you have thanks josh um if you have data from a different sites like you know uh, maybe try to pull that in somehow but the i often like to think of the project as you know just contained and, and not re like not changing the working directory uh don't know if that answered your question or not okay sometimes Yeah, Kyra, I completely agree. Sometimes just trying again, sometimes it works. <laughs> Sonia said, I'm uploading it. I uploaded a sad plot, not showing any lies. Oh no, that's okay. I, I, I'd like to see it. Oh, I realized that the viewer drive link is not in there. Let me. Oh, it's there. Okay, it's there. Uh, I'm curious about how the lock scale is handling negative values. It doesn't. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that's that's one of the that's one of the I think warning that uh, I asked here. Um, let's see. Right. So and then NAN's not a numbers produced because um, it was trying to take either log of zero or log of uh, negative value. So. Kyra, you already answered the first question for everyone. <laughs> oh, Sonia, I saw your plot. So I think it's just because it's too small. If you could expand your plot a little bit better, uh, sorry, bigger, um, like maybe your, yeah, maybe like this is too small. Um, and that would be, you know, that, that would make it, everything would just be squeezed together in one thing. So it wouldn't work. Or click zoom, it will pop out. Yes. Yay, it works. You're welcome. Um, I give, I give people maybe, oh gosh, it's already 7.50. Okay, so let's, let's wrap this up. Well, I'm, I'm going to go through all of this real quick. Uh, sorry, I did not realize the time at all. Um, I honestly thought it was like 7.30. Okay, so let's go through this real quick. Yes, we can add scale log 10 to plot it and it would be fine. Um, but it has the warning again because of the uh, lesson or equal to zero value, non positive value. Um, and, you know, sometimes you can say that, oh, this is unfair because, you know, it makes the US looks a lot. Um, it, it doesn't look as bad um, compared to when you plot it, when you make it really bad. So, like this, obviously the US really stand out. 
So yeah, it's once again up to you on as to how you want to communicate your data. Um, you can use X scale X date um, to do breaks. So I think I can do X breaks equal every two months and that would work. Yes. Um, maybe add FT theme. You can use other themes as well if you want, um, but you can add this in here and uh, rerun. Oh, wow. So the bricks did work, but it makes this as um, like 2020 and then a bunch of other things in it. So one other thing that you would have to do is labels equals and I don't remember this so I will cheat and go down here and see what I did before. Um, date labels here. Okay, so date labels month. If you scroll down all the way to the bottom, you see the answer. So uh, oops. This should work. And then you can add FG theme to it. Um, do you think the X axis label is necessary? I would say no, I don't think it's necessary. Thanks, Amy, for giving me some time here. Um, the Y axis can be, you know, like weekly, moving average, something like that. Uh, you can make the color of the highlighted country, whatever color you want, um, oops. but you need to put it in quote. So let's make sure you do so. Can you also angle the X axis labels in this view? Yes. Yes, I only know how to do that using theme. So you can do theme X. Oh, come on, give me something. Axis, yes, axis X text X, I believe. And then you can do element text angle equals 90, hopefully. And let me just add that to down here rather than just change that. Yep. This is what data viz does, it's fun. Yeah, you seem to I always have to look up the exact command. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, it's yeah, I, I used to just copy paste from my old code, but then it took too long. So I try to memorize because um, it's it essentially it kind of makes sense. You know, everything in theme is element something. So I can just try it out. And then if, you know, uh, one one thing that I always forget is like the adjust command. But um, yeah. OK, and then you can all uh, put it all together. Um, and that's it. Uh, there are some other questions down here if you want extra credits. Uh, and the, the final answer is down at the very bottom. If you browse the, the RStudio space a little bit, you see some other things. Uh, you can find other nuggets in here as well. Um, I generate this table. Where is it? Table. Uh, Got PNG by Gbot. The code is in there if you want to see it. Um, but uh, yeah, and there's some other cool things that you can do some generative stuff with Gbot as well, which I, I find really entertaining. Um, Oh, Catherine asked, okay, would you mind repeating what plus null does at the end? Yes. Um, 
what Kara said is essentially correct. Uh, it allows you to comment out of the parts without worrying a rogue bluffs at the end of your code. Okay, so let me just explain that one more time, just so that um, people see how powerful this thing is. Okay, so if say so, okay, say I have this code, and I want to, um, but I don't want my scale y log ten at the end here, and I want to comment that out. Then I want to see what it looks like. But if I do this. Um, Oftentimes I have to come up here and like comment that out separately that this plus sign right here, but um, uh, And you know, otherwise it, it wouldn't run because it says attempt to use zero length variable name, which is not what I was attempting to do attempting to do. Um, so I would often have to do this, which is sometimes annoying. And so what plus null does to me is that um, It would I, if I originally had this, I can just, and it would generate the same exact same plot, and I can just comment this out without worrying about um, the final um, plus sign. Yes. Thank you, Kara. <laughs> and and the same for for um, the the piping uh, this as well. So I can just comment out this, and it would work. If you pipe it into braces dot braces. Thank you, Allison. Life changing tricks right here. <laughs> Thanks, Carla. <laughs> I know it. It really, it was really annoying to for me to, you know, learn uh, to, like have to go back to to it. Um, but yeah, I have recently really loved just hitting command and uh, or control, I guess, in on um, um, Windows or Linux machine, and just you know click on the data set without having to go through my so many other data sets and to view it. So, and I think the view view with capitalized V command in our studio has been uh, has improved greatly because I used to it would freeze a lot before so uh, thanks everyone oh and I forgot to mention that at I think 8 30 eastern time um, there there's a talk uh, our ladies meetup I think no is it a use our meetup that um, people talk about the R markdown thanks Jerome um, our markdown latest updates and things like that. Um, so check that check out that meetup if you are not having dinner or something. It's not too late. Thanks everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Chang. Um, excellent talk. Um, yeah, so many tips, and I'm sure we're all going to be coming back to the resources you created for the meetup as well. So yeah, thanks so much. <laughs>